when I first started studying gemology, I didn't realize how much I will learn about other areas, geology, geography. It actually made me kind of sad because I, in middle school, hated geology. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Rebecca. We've got Brittany here, one of our in-house geologists. I understand that you found a really cool specimen that you wanted to show us today. Well, you're definitely going to be impressed. Okay. But it's a, it's a little too big, so it's gonna not be in one of our boxes. Oh my goodness. Oh. <laughs> That's a box. Oh my goodness, that green. How pretty is that? Obviously, the first thing that you're gonna notice is this beautiful emerald that is shining right in the middle. This one is specifically from Colombia, from the Cazquez mine in the Andes Mountain. Emerald is a beryllium aluminum silicate colored by chromium and or vanadium. Colombia is generally considered the most prized country of origin for emeralds. There's some interesting geology going on there. Mm -hmm. I like looking at bigger specimens with their matrix because it does tell a story like, hey, what was going on here? How did this form? Tell us a little bit about that. Like rock is where my expertise kind of goes away. So <laughs> let's hear it. What's neat about the Colombian emerald deposits is that black shale is the main host matrix. Other emerald deposits, most of them is mica schist. In most other places, the dominant form for emeralds to form is magnetism. But for the Colombian deposit, it is metamorphic. Metamorphic means the rocks change due to heat and pressure and also involved hydrothermal fluids. For the emerald, of course, we need the beryllium and then we need the chromium to give a, that nice green color. The black shales themselves held these two components and as it interacted with the fluids, it was able to create conditions for the emerald to grow in. I believe this white mineral is calcite. That is what's typically associated with Colombian emeralds. In the emerald mines, the workers will start digging wherever this white calcite is found on the black shale. Around it is like this brown corroded area. It's kind of like bubbly here and all that stuff. So what kind of happened is when this emerald was in formation, whatever was in that fluid was eating away this white mineral. It might be a little hard to see here, but if you look underneath the emerald, the fluid almost got all the way underneath and yeah. almost completely disconnected the emerald. But there's still just a little bit touching the emerald in the very back. And I don't know if you can see it very well, but here at the very top, we got this tiny little pyrite vein and it kind of starts to form its own crystal shape. Iron is present in a lot of emeralds formed in the rest of the world and will often increase the blue tone in the emerald. We don't see that as often in the Colombian emeralds because the iron kind of takes on a different form and often becomes pyrite. That was really cool. I love that specimen. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I have more to show you. Love it. Here you go. Oh, so I know this guy. This is a trapiche emerald. It's an incredibly clean emerald. It's a cabochon. It has amazing color. Tell us a little bit about what makes a trapiche emerald trapiche. So the name trapiche comes from what it looks like which is from grinding wheels from sugar mills. Most trapeche emeralds that you will find specifically do come from Colombia. This dark mineral is the shale. That's the same as the host rock here. As this emerald was forming, it came more in contact with the shale. Very unique timing that occurs here. Part of the shale gets mixed in with the emerald, but because Beryl is part of the hexagonal crystal system. The shale kind of gets pushed towards the specific hexagonal crystal axes, and as it grows, it just keeps pushing it there into those very unique lines. And actually, you can see like a black core mm -hmm. that looks like a hexagon, which is where they all intersect. Trapeches are a fascinating type of emerald. Oh, I love them. They're just so unique. Are you ready to open another box? I'm ready. I'm always ready. <laughs> Oh, nice. So these emeralds come from Brazil. So tell us what's different about these. I obviously see the gray rock. This gray host matrix rock is a type of mica schist. This mica is more typical of the matrix you'll find emeralds in around the world. Brazilian emeralds formed from magma instead of 
hydrothermal fluids. That creates a whole world of difference. If you look even just at this piece in general compared to that one from Columbia, that one's a, like more of a vibrant green mm -hmm. in its color and these are just a slightly more dull but still a beautiful green color. These emeralds will also have different inclusions and we can see that in this large slice right here. I brought a handy dandy flashlight. So kind of here in kind of like this dark circled area within mm -hmm. the emerald slice, there's a chunk of it that's a lot more opaque. Mm -hmm. This is chromite. Chromite is generally one of the first minerals to separate from cooling magma, so this can give you a clue to an emerald's origins. And is chromite metallic? Yes. Yeah, that, it yeah. looks very metallic. Mm -hmm. And there is another darker mineral that's more towards the top, and this is biotite. Biotite mica specifically, it points more towards a magmatic origin, which is how these emeralds have formed. And determining locality for emerald is actually quite important. There are some gemstones where value really depends on locality. Emerald is one of those. This next slice over here doesn't have very large inclusions, but there's kind of like this white color center within the emerald. And if you look at it even closer around the white color center are alternating green and white colors. What this tells us is that it's color zoning. Color zoning in general has a lot to do with the heat that comes from the magma as it's forming. Beryl itself is allochromatic, which means naturally without any impurities is colorless. It takes impurities to color itself, which in this instance is chromium. Eventually, the color was able to finally hone in and stay a part of the emerald and continue its growth from what was once colorless barrel to green emerald. And it's just really neat to see. I love those. I think slices are really cool. It's a fun gift for people. If you know anybody who's born in May, that's for sale. So you can go get that at one of our authorized retailers, JTV. So geology is super interesting to me. It's not my forte, so I love learning a little bit more about it, but I actually have some things to show you a little bit more from the gemology side. All right, Brittany, your turn. I get to open a box? Yes, you do. Oh, delightful. Oh, wow. There's a lot of beautiful things in here. So this is an emerald pendant. It's 5.11 carats, and it's from Afghanistan. It's a Panjshir emerald, which is in the northeastern region. Afghanistan is a very interesting source of emeralds. It really didn't become a commercially viable source until the 1970s. Even in the third century BC, there are mentions of a green stone coming out of Afghanistan. And so a lot of people think that these emeralds have at least been around and known about for a significant period of time, even though they've only been commercially mined, you know, for the last 40 years. There is a lot of geopolitical instabilities. Sourcing has been very difficult. This was actually acquired in May 2021. And for people who know what happened in Afghanistan in August of 2021, it makes this acquisition a little bit more interesting to me. You really just don't know under certain circumstances if gems are going to be able to be procured. So that's the first thing. The second is the color. Chemically, Afghani emeralds and Colombian emeralds are the most similar. I think Afghani emeralds are actually really good buys. Emerald, from a market perspective, is a very valued stone. We see all of this popularity and this value because of how people enjoy it, mostly in faceted form and in pieces of jewelry. Probably most people have also heard of the emerald cut. That is how many emeralds are faceted. Emeralds are about a seven and a half to eight on the most scale, so pretty hard, but they're also very brittle. An emerald cut is essentially a rectangle with chopped off corners. So there are eight sides and the chopped off corners allow them to be protected as opposed to like a pointed corner, which is very vulnerable to, to chips and breaking. Both of these emeralds are an emerald cut. 
Most barrels are what are called type one stones. When you think about the clarity of colored stones, you have type one, type two, and type three. Type one, the stone should be pretty free of eye visible inclusions. Type two, you should see some amount of inclusions. Type three, you should expect inclusions. Emerald is a type three stone. A lot of the reason for that has to do with its geology and all the things that get trapped. So I brought other members of the barrel family just to show you the difference between type one and type three stones. This is a morganite. And this is an aquamarine. And they are, you know, clear as day. Super clear. In contrast, this is actually a Colombian emerald and you can actually see the color similarities in faceted and crystal form. This is a very fine emerald, but you have a lot of inclusions. So when you're buying emerald, it's important to realize that you can still pay a premium for even included emeralds. That emerald is remarkable from an inclusion perspective. It is almost clean. It is lightly oiled. Because emerald is a type three stone, most emeralds on the market are treated. Usually with emeralds, it's called oiling. They heat the emerald and the oil kind of seeps into the fractures and has a similar refractive index and it kind of blends in with the surrounding minerals. Sometimes if you rotate the stone, you'll see like an, an orange, a yellow, a blue flash, and that will often indicate that it has been filled. This one in particular has very mild oiling. Even mild treatment is something that's really prized and that's a very clean stone. Fairly atypical for an emerald. When a gem is super popular, people often try to imitate it or synthesize it. This little guy is an example of a synthetic emerald. This is created by the Chatham process. So what happens is you have a seed plate, usually of barrel or emerald, and you have a powdered material that is deposited into a molten flux and it essentially crystallizes on the seed plate and you get this crystal. Actually from a distance, flux emeralds can be pretty good imitators of natural emeralds. You have to be careful if you're buying because it's pretty common to salt parcels of emeralds with flux emeralds. So it's important to have a keen eye. You wanna keep an eye out for inclusions that are particular to synthetics like platinum platelets or nail head cavities. I've loved looking at all of these different emerald specimens and faceted gems today, but as you know, on this channel, we pick our favorites to take a closer look. You go oh, first. Oh, <laughs> ooh, all right. Um, good amount to choose from. Actually gonna do this trapiche, just because instead of looking at the story from the outside, you're looking at the story within. I love that so much, I was also gonna choose that. Oh. So. For that sake, I'll choose this fast food guy. I love the clarity, the color, it's just beautiful. So take a closer look at hers and then mine. love emeralds here. It's the birthstone of May. It's one of the big three. If you want to learn more about emeralds or really any other gemstone, go to our website gemstones.com where you can watch videos, read articles. we got so much for you to enjoy on there. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Thanks for watching.